Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Devolution for the Powers Committee meeting this morning. Um, the, the first thing I need to deal with is apologies, and we have apologies <coughs> from Tavish Scott and also from Rob Gibson and Bill Kidd he is here um, um, substituting for Rob Gibson and also for, for, for Lewis MacDonald. Um, three sub, three um, apologies this morning. Uh, the first thing we've got to decide this morning in item one is a decision on taking um, item three in private. Are we, uh, do we agree to do that? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you very much, um, committee. Uh, t which takes us neatly to agenda item two, and I'm very grateful <coughs> for our visitors this morning who are prepared to give evidence to us. Um, we have a panel of four people, and if I could just go through who they are. Uh, Charlotte Barber, who's the head of taxation at ICAS. Professor Anton Muscatelli, the principal of Glasgow University. Gwyneth Schofield, who's the director of the, D, of the PWC, Price Waterhouse Cooper, and, and Steve Couch, who's a partner of the same organisation. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Now, as usual, uh, the, you know, you'll get questions around the room from my colleagues. Some of them will be directed to you as a panel. Some of them will be directed to you as individuals. And we'll just see where this takes us. Um, I think I'll, I'll kick off with a very general question, if you don't mind, though. You've obviously now had some of the chance to see the detail of the government's draft clauses and taxations as part of the command paper. Uh, so it would be use, very useful to have your views as a panel um, on how they're drafted, you know, what practical challenges lie ahead by way of implementation of the new powers, and what do you think of, of them as a package, and how cohesive are they, are they all together? Now, that's effectively asking you to make an open statement in its own way. Um, but if, if, I don't know who wants to kick off with that. Morning, everybody. I'm quite happy to start. Um, I think that um, the clauses have been um, drafted with a degree of consistency with what we've seen in the past. There's nothing that's surprising that's come through in the way that the clauses are drafted, um, nor in um, the expectation of what will be needed as a further step um, in terms of full implementation. Um, the one comment I would make, um, uh, and this relates to a theme that may come through in terms of simplicity, um, if you look at the nature of the way the clauses are drafted and how they refer back to previous acts, whether that be Scotland Act or whether that be um, other income tax UK acts, um, there is a piece around just making this all simple in terms of the language that's used and the communication that's necessary to get this out to employers and to the public generally. The packages itself, rather than more than just about the practicalities. Of I think there's a logical um, uh, step on from, from Smith. Um, I think that's well referred to in, in, in the document um, accompanying the, cl the clauses. Um, so I would say it's a, it's a helpful um, rather than unhelpful step. Okay, Steve. An Anton, you want to? Th yes, thank you very much, Chair. Perhaps I should just explain at the start. I'm here in a personal capacity as opposed to representing the, the University of Glasgow. So uh, just to, I said that last time I appeared in front of the committee. I think there are a number of areas which I think need to be looked at very carefully as this uh, command paper then uh, finds its way into, into legislation. Um, in relation not only to tax but also the interactions between the tax uh, provisions and the fiscal framework uh, section of the command paper. Um, I'm particularly concerned, for instance, about the issues around borrowing powers, which aren't outlined at the moment within, of course, the command paper. But it does raise some really interesting issues, as I think I set out when I was last in front of this committee, because if one uh, does devolve more taxation powers, the way one frames uh, the fiscal framework and future for the UK has implications on how those fiscal powers can then be used by, by, by Scotland. And I think uh, there's, there's some really interesting issues there that I think you, you, you may want to explore. I also have uh, an issue, I think, in the way that uh, the no detriment clauses uh, are, have, might translate uh, in, into the command paper. I mean, the, the Smith Commission, I said, I think set out some very clear no detriment clauses. But how they were interpreted in practice, as the paper recognises, is actually quite complex. Um, and, I mean, the, the paper gives a couple of examples of how this might work with income taxation and, and adjustments to the block grant. But, in fact, as it recognises, there are many more. It's more likely to be much more complicated in practice. And so it will require a very clear understanding of how all this will be resolved between the two governments going forward. Um, and I think this is one of the areas, I think, that needs to be look at, looked at. 
Um, and there are some issues which I appreciate welfare powers will be discussed at some other time, but uh, similar interdependencies between changes in welfare and the block grant, I think, will need to be recognized. In terms of the package, I, 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 let me just say one thing. I mean, when, when I came in front of this committee, I, I did say that uh, given that there seems to be much greater appetite for, for greater fiscal autonomy in, in Scotland, and that seems to be clear, then I, I, I think one has to avoid situations where one creates potential clashes. I think one of the concerns I have about the Smith Commission deal is that it reserved, for instance, the personal allowance, the fact that it you know, reserved uh, national income contributions. And, and, and one of the big issues uh, for me is around uh, in-work benefits. And, of course, by reserving universal credit, and I appreciate you may want to consider that at, at another session, it does mean that the whole interaction between welfare payments around low pay and income taxation is, is therefore not, not brought into play. I, I do think that that will create potentially tensions going forward. And so how this is managed within uh, future legislation is going to be, I think, hugely important. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, ICAS is pleased to be invited. Uh, I think, uh, as an overall comment, the clauses do what Smith sets out to do. Uh, in the main, there's plenty more for us to discuss uh, as we go along and, and go further down the line. Uh, the income tax, I think, offers quite a, a brave and imaginative path between using existing machinery with HMRC and existing legislation but still building on what we've got with the Scottish rate of income tax and bringing further powers into the Scottish Parliament. You know, it addresses all of those three. On the other hand, given that it's got those three elements sitting together, they will still need to interact afterwards, and we might come back to allocation of responsibilities in that way. There's a small bit about capital gains tax, which I think is just a, necess a necessary block to sit with the income tax, I don't think it affects capital gains tax itself. Uh, it's an understandable bit that's there. The two small taxes that are being devolved, they're fine, they're relatively standalone. They're quite easy. They're like the ones that are already devolved and quite easy to devolve. The VAT, I think, offers more opportunity for perhaps discussion as to how it might be uh, calculated. It, it slots in with the difficulties with fiscal framework and it slots in with some of the no detriment issues because I'm not quite sure how you calculate it uh, and if you take rather a general uh, estimation type of process then it's not going to marry up with giving you a true reflection of the Scottish economy and the better it marries up to the economy the more difficult it is to calculate I think and those kind of elements might or might not run through how you calculate no detriment. Uh, th there's one other point I perhaps might make as a, a kind of opening comment, and that's that the package that we've got offers a variety of different taxes to be devolved, and they offer different types of devolution. We've got kind of what I would call full devolution on the smaller taxes like aggregates levy and air passenger duty, and that lock, stock and barrel comes here. It'd be switched off from Westminster for Scotland and not quite you can do what you like with it but, but you know what I mean uh, it, it, it will be Scottish full stop then the income tax is partially devolved so there's going to be joint responsibilities uh, as Professor Muscatelli suggested the UK will still have responsibility for a large proportion of it all the legislation and HMRC and so Scottish powers will need to interact with that uh, and they'll have to mesh together as well as going into the welfare side of it. So that needs a bit of management. And then the VAT is completely different too because it's an assignment as opposed to having anything really much to do with Scottish powers per se. And I th think one of the issues that come out of that for me is that I'm not sure that a lot of people amongst the public have a full understanding of what Scottish taxes are or that they're different with different powers attaching. Okay. Well, it's a very helpful opening. Um, but, let, let, can we take this in sort of two ways? Let's start with borrowing powers, and, and detriment is obviously in that element as well. So if we started off in that area, I think that would probably, because that's from the indications we've had, and with the fiscal framework that will be required later, that's an area that we're going to have to get into in some detail. I think, Stuart, you had a question on no detriment issues. Yes, well, thank you. Good morning, panel. On the no detriment, um, uh, none of you mentioned a moment ago the issue of the APD. 
Uh, and it's something that we have discussed uh, in this committee in the past, and the, with, with the issue of if APD is fully devolved, uh, and then this Parliament then well, has the powers to do, uh, set its, rate, its rates, etc. Uh, but the issue of the, the, the competition uh, regarding the regional airports, uh, particularly in the north of England, um, how does that um, stack up with the, the issue of the no detriment? The technical issue, that's, uh, I don't know if you have views on it, Professor Muscatelli, but it's a bit like the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax versus the Stamp Duty Land Tax. If you've got differentials, that's where it goes. I, I think this is an example of, of how, uh, f for all these adjustments, uh, do you adjust initially and, and then what happens, or do you adjust in terms of second and third round effects? As you say, supposing, you know, let's take a, a, an ima imaginary scenario where Scotland decides to reduce uh, APD, that impacts, uh, that then leads to an immediate adjustment because uh, there will be, it will impact on, on air traffic and then there might be, say, a year or two later, some, some change in, in, in APD in the rest of the UK. I think it depends how, I mean, it depends how, whether you just take those second and third round adjustments in, into account or not. I my own feeling is that it's less serious, to be honest, around something like APD because of the point that Charlotte made earlier, which is it's devolved fully. It's not a huge amount of taxation. I think it's more likely to be serious around income taxation because it's just so interdependent. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there'll need to be an eye as to how these... Uh, second and third round effects, if you like, impact. I mean, if you look at, for instance, I, I, don't, I don't want to shift away from APD, but if you look at the, the discussion around uh, Box 1, which is uh, uh, around income taxation, there is a, there's an agreement in principle as to how all this could be managed in terms of uh, UK risks and Scottish risks. But then, of course, there are uh, open questions around how, in terms of long-term long demographic trends, that should be adjusted. Uh, in a sense, APD is very similar to that. Do you really do you adjust it once and for all, or do you then take into account that other issues? I think it's cleaner when it's a tax that's fully devolved because the argument there would be you would have a once and for all adjustment, and after that, it really would be up to Scotland to manage its tax base. But in the issues, Professor Muscatelli just raised about income tax and no detriment issues there. But Linda, I think you wanted to. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's related. I, I was interested. Um, Professor Musk will tell you about what you said about the issue, for example, it's all about interaction, but personal allowances and uh, national insurance, etc., not being part of the package. Um, then what could be, what has been said by others is that the fact that there's a zero rate that can be applied, it's, some would say it's a SOP, others would say it's uh, something that can be worked with well. How do you perceive that interaction uh, as a cohesion when there's the ability for that zero rate? I, I mean, uh, as you say, there is the, I mean, at the moment, the way it's framed, and we'll need to see how it's translated into legislation effectively with the ability to set, a, if there is the ability to set a zero rate, in, in effect, the personal allowance would, would, be, would, be, would be devolved, at least in terms of being able to raise the, the allowance above the UK level, if that's allowed in the eventual le legislation. Um, I, I, I do think, I mean, it's just, I think it's just one example of situations which could emerge. I mean, l l let, me give you, let me give you another example where the fact that because this is partial devolution of income tax and national insurance, it could lead to conflict. I mean, the examples that are given, I think it's on page, uh, I think it's on page 31 around no de the no detriment clauses um, are, 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 pretty, are pretty clean ones um, because they relate to, in oh, it's, yeah, it's page 31 around, uh, I think it's paragraph Roman numeral 1 and Roman numeral 2 and, and 2, 4, 14. Uh, in both these cases, in a sense, these are the easiest examples because they deal with decreases in UK income tax or increases in UK income tax when you're trying to um, deal with either an increase or a decrease in either devolved or reserve spending. And that's pretty clean. And you can see how you can have a first round adjustment uh, to, to take account of that to ensure that, that, that uh, the, the decisions are as compartmentalized in the rest of the UK or Scotland as possible. But imagine where instead you have a change uh, in spending in, in the rest of the UK, which is financed using, say, a national insurance change. 
We've seen that before with health spending um, in the, under the previous government in the UK. That will now have knock-on effects because it, you know, national insurance, although it's, as I said in my previous evidence, is sometimes seen as a separate thing, and in fact it's part of the whole income tax structure. And by not devolving national insurance, I think it creates potential for conflict there, and, and it will impact on the Scottish tax base. So I think this is one of the issues which, you know, this is why I would have preferred to see a cleaner um, allocation of, of, of all income tax and, 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 and employment income powers to Scotland because it would have avoided these sorts of clashes. So here's an example where that interaction uh, could, could, could create some difficulties for the two governments in trying to ex trace exactly who did what and what the impact is on the respective tax bases. As other panel members like to reflect on, on what the professor said, any, any contrary views? Or do, you, or, do you share his, or do you share the professor's view? I, on the, uh, from a, I know that's what I'm trying to... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would not want to be too involved in the setup of the fiscal framework in terms of that's a matter for um, government and other parties to look at. Um, I think that from a PWC perspective, we're looking at what results and what comes through and how that is implemented. Okay, fair can enough. I, can, I, can I just refer you to your paper that says, for reasons of legality, practicality, and certain taxes are not suitable for devolution in this category, and you included national, you, could you expand on the reasons of legality and practicality, why yeah. what's been just suggested would um, not be yes. suitable for? Yes, um, and what I would refer you to there is that we've looked at the transparency, we've looked at the simplicity, and at the time that paper was written, I think we were saying that the, um, the steps would be complicated. No, no I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not giving any view in relation to um, what I'm saying now. I'm referring to your question on the paper and saying that at that time when we were going through that paper, I'm not saying that the, the view is different now. That, that is what we concluded. Okay. Uh, did I think it's very difficult to pull any one part of the UK taxes apart? And it leads to these kind of setups as to whether national insurance and income tax go together. And certainly in the last few decades... Our institute, for instance, has always said that income tax and national insurance might have been married up together because they look like one and the same quite often. Uh, and that could lead you in this direction. But equally, it could be the case that perhaps one ought to stop and have a think and say, well, should they be the same? Or do you want to do something slightly more radical and just work with the income tax? But they are all finally, really finely interwoven the, the different taxes, and that includes national insurance in my book, uh, except it's not everybody's book, uh, and other policies. Okay. Alex? I was just going to say that during the course of the current government, there's been a lot of pressure to raise tax thresholds, uh, and that pressure inevitably will continue. However, there is a strong and growing uh, field of opinion that says that we need to take our eye off tax thresholds and start looking at the impact of national insurance and the low paid. Now, if that had been devolved, would that not offer a very early opportunity for an extreme divergence in uh, the application of national insurance at the low end of uh, wage scales? Yes, and, and arguably, I mean, I would be one of those economists who would argue, and I, there's been various reviews of the UK tax system, that we should be trying to marry them up because one of the biggest issues around uh, income inequality, for instance, is, is around you know, low pay in work. And, and, and a lot of that is to do with, with very high marginal tax rates, as I said in my previous paper to this committee. So actually, it would have been interesting. It's, it's a hypothetical scenario, but supposing national insurance had been devolved, they would have given Scotland an opportunity to, to look at that uh, as a whole. Interestingly, I suspect they might have also triggered uh, a similar review, you know, south of the border, um, because of the fact that then you could have quite substantial divergence. It might have led to, to that sort of uh, uh, change. Um, however it's engineered, I would be in favour of such a change because for the reasons that Charlotte has, has alluded, I mean, the two things are, are becoming closer and closer together, and, and the, the, the tax structure... Tax plus national insurance structure in the UK is hugely complex. It leads to a very strange pattern of marginal rates as you, as you go through the earnings spectrum. And, of course, the other point that you perhaps need to watch out if you're looking, focusing on income tax and national insurance is that a lot of the measures that we've had against anti-avoidance, well, anti-avoidance mm -hmm. measures that we've had in recent years with HMRC are not just 
national insurance versus income tax, but that package versus corporation tax and versus dividends. And one of the things that, you'll, that, that I think needs to be perhaps watched here is, depending on where income tax might go, it might have a knock-on effect in, say, family businesses, uh, individuals who think themselves to be self-employed, however one wants to define that, might want to work through companies or they might pay themselves dividends and head off into UK tax. Or, equally, they might want to stay with Scottish tax, depending. But if you've got differentials, you'll start bringing that into play. Mm -hmm. yep. I think what we hear from our clients is that, you know, they actually want it to be simple and transparent, and I think that came out through Smith Commission and the recommendations. And by, you know, what is proposed um, post-Smith is actually a further development of, in effect, the Scotland Act 2012, which, in effect, it's, it's a step-by-step -step approach. I think by bringing national insurance into there brings through complex issues and will lead people to try and decide whether, they, like um, Charlotte says, whether they're employed or self-employed and how that interaction works. And I think there's a a desire for business to become aware of the timing of these changes, how those changes are going to be communicated, and to keep it simple and to take it in step-by-step -step stages. Um, so for me, to actually stick um, to like looking at the income tax and being very clear about what that means for business and for employers and how they implement that going forward is probably one of the key messages that should come out of Smith. Make it simple, make it clear, and then move forward on that basis. Yeah, I think Stuart, there are, but I'll come back to, I'm going to come back to Stuart McMillan at the end of this Sorry. little session to let him sweep oh. up because I didn't let him in on a supplementary. But did I see Stuart Maxwell? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, thank you, Kimber. Um, I'm, I think one of the questions I had was, because I, I didn't understand your comments, Steve, about um, uh, national insurance contributions when it was asked by Duncan McNeill. You, you, you quite clearly in your paper said you know, that you, these taxes are not suitable for devolution for legality and practical reasons. I just, could, you, could you tell us what those legal and practical reasons I didn't understand? Okay. The um, so the, the practical reasons, I think we've had some hints well, of that. Hints of that, yeah. Of, in, in terms of what's come through in the discussion. Um, would you like me to comment further on practical reasons? <coughs> yes, I'm, I'm just trying to understand why you came okay. to the conclusion. So, so in terms of um, what can be um, devolved most easily when you look at the list of taxes, which is what we've done, then national insurance raises complexities that aren't present in the same way in relation to income tax. Um, we've discounted corporation tax because it raises complexities as well. I understand that, yeah. And what's the legal problem? Um, I think the legal problem is... A, 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 do you want to comment on that? Yeah, it's, really it's the linkage between national insurance and the, and the welfare. And if you fully, fully devolve that, it's around the fiscal powers and actually getting that um, a little bit clearer because there is quite an interlink between the two. So it makes it complicated for it to be actually further devolved. And in Smith, if you think about it, welfare and the taxing powers sit in two very separate buckets, I think is the way I'd describe it. And the bringing of those together through the de further development of national insurance would be inevitable because they do sit together. Yeah, so I'm, I'm struggling a bit on this. Uh -huh. I still don't understand what the legal problem is. I mean, I understand there are complexities, um, and there are complexities even with the, the proposal that's on the table just now from the Smith Commission and the draft, uh, the draft uh, the parts we've had already. But I'm just... I'm just trying, I am I apologise if, it, if it's me, it's me that's here, but I'm struggling to understand what the legal problem is because, of course, there'll be complexity. Of course, there's the argument about no detriment, and of course, there's the argument about, you know, if, if in terms of, we're struggling, we're straining into welfare, but if a welfare change is made here, then affect, how does that affect um, uh, other benefits? How does that affect, you know, are they taken off at the other end? I mean, what, what, I understand that there's complexity, but I'm just trying to make clear or understand what the legal problem is with the devolution of, uh, of, of, uh, sorry, of uh, national insurance contributions. I wasn't involved in the context of writing the paper, but my um, suspicion is that thought is around European law. And some of the... Steve, maybe, maybe uh, and if you weren't involved in writing the paper, we understand that in these... So I'm, I'm happy to give a fuller answer. OK, but if you can't, but if you can't we, we could always follow up and write that earlier. No, I, I, I will follow up on this point in writing, but yeah. what comes to mind is the interaction of um, social security regulations across the European Union, which is a different set of criteria compared to the, reaction of in, uh, the interaction of income tax across the European Union. 
So, for example, with uh, Social Security, we have different rules for cross-border workers compared to the rules that we have for um, income tax. So how you contribute in, when you're working abroad to a Social Security system is different to the rules for income tax. And I suspect that some of the legal complexity around the interaction of the European Union rules on Social Security and the UK rules on Social Security are behind what we're saying there. Yeah. I knew this was going to be complex, so um, it would be helpful. If we, and, <laughs> it would be helpful. I, I, if we I'm very happy to come back. <laughs> once I, it would be helpful. Once got that, but, but because um, I just don't. I'm sorry. I'm just. I, I just yeah. don't understand what yeah. the particular issue is. So, so there are. There's a set of social security. No, rules. I understand the, the general point. I just don't understand the detail of why it would lead you to this position. So it would be helpful if it was more detailed. Very happy to see that. I yeah. think that would be helpful. Linda. Yeah, I would like to come, move away from that wee bit and come back to the personal allowance aspect of what I asked initially. Um, personal allowance has not been devolved, um, but the ability to have a zero rate in income tax. And I'm just trying to, to bottom out both the interaction with welfare, but also the no detriment clauses. So perhaps, to make it simpler for me, a scenario um, where a future Scottish government said, right, OK, we can't... Uh, play around with the, the personal allowance, but um, we know the UK issue, for example, is £10,000 for personal allowance before you pay tax. So what we're going to do is apply a zero rate up to £20,000. So how would you, and I know it's just sort of looking at a crystal ball in a way, but how would you imagine the no detriment principle applying there and the issue of how that interacts with welfare. I would expect, if it's a Scottish Parliament decision, to effectively take the personal allowance up to 20,000, say, then that's a decision that has been made here in exercise of your share of the powers, and therefore the reduced income that you would get would sit here full stop... Uh, what I think might be more interesting, uh, uh, and I haven't completely got my head round yet, I might pass it along the line, is say for some reason we went back to having lower personal allowances and the UK set it at, say, 5,000, uh, for argument's sake, keep it in round numbers, then what you do and how that flows through, I don't know, because your calculations might have started today at a kind of 10,000 benchmark. Uh, and... I think all those no detriment things flow through. And it's also quite interesting because it's not just no detriment, is it? It's also whether your taxes are almost becoming hypothecated. And it's not just the complete bucket that income tax pays for at the moment, but if Scots are voting on a particular Scottish rate of tax say, for their income tax, and it's spent on education and health, then perhaps other elements go somewhere else. There's quite a bit underneath it all with the joint responsibilities. I mean, that's a, that's a very good answer, actually, but uh, it's, a, it's a very good answer. <laughs> But I, one of the issues that arises is exactly, is, exactly, is exactly that. I mean, supposing... If there is an increase, if there's a zero rate, it's exactly that. It's a, it's a re reduction in taxation in Scotland. It would need to be absorbed within Scottish spending, and, and, and that would, that's how it would work. However, I mean, if you look at a cut, a reduction in, in, in the personal allowance, would, that would then, you know, that would be then the example on page 31, because it would, you know, the question is why would the, why would the UK Parliament be doing this? This is an attempt to try and reduce taxation and therefore reduce spending, and, and you'd be then in that sort of territory. But it would definitely have an impact because it would force the hand of a Scottish Parliament if it, say, it started with a zero rate. It would, really, I mean, it would, it would almost certainly force that because otherwise you would end up having a really odd tax structure mm -hmm. around that. So it's an example of where income tax thresholds have been devolved, and you would think that Scotland then has the power to do what it would like, but then, as soon as if somebody were to reduce the allowance and, and impose a different tax structure at the bottom of the tax band, it would force Scotland's hand. And, and I think this is where it gets, you know, this is where it's a bit messy. I think, frankly, by not devolving the personal allowance. But perhaps I could give a comparison. 
I don't know if you recollect, a few years ago, there was small companies, their corporation tax rate was reduced to zero. And that was just meant to be a reduction in tax rates, wasn't it, to encourage business, whereas, in fact, every man and his dog incorporated. And you know, then there was a loss of tax take as well. And then the whole thing was reversed. I actually think it's quite difficult. Uh, and again, it comes back to this point of your... Your, your tax res responsibilities and income tax are shared. And over and above that, income tax interacts with other taxes. I don't think there's a lot of scope to radically change what you've got here. Uh, and that's not just a Conservative accounting speaking. <laughs> I mean, a, I think that, you know, that's a, a very interesting point about what scope you've got. Uh -huh. In any constitutional arrangement, a radical shift on taxation that can shift people across borders and decide where they would pay tax yeah. would be the same irrespective of the constitutional position, would it not? Whether it be independence, devolution, light, heavy, yeah. whatever, whatever. Yeah. Yes. Radical shifts mm -hmm. would get that, 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 that outcome. Is it, is it not a, Possibly. an improved situation if you can influence through intergovernmental relations and, 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 and agreements and notice that we, 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 can, actually, we, we can actually affect the situation but not tip the situation. Is, is that, is that, is that it's getting that balance, isn't it, of, of, of doing what you want to do without tipping the balance through unforeseen consequences. And it depends critically what the intergovernmental arrangements are, that if there is an ability well, we to influence... We haven't come to that yet, yeah. that, you know, but, but I think that, you know, you know, in three committee meetings, I think that's becoming more and more critical. Yeah, absolutely. I tell you, I'm going to let Stuart McMillan finish off this little section, and then actually I think it's quite important that we get into this intergovernment relations, because that's issue the, actually the issue about the fiscal framework and how it's going to work. And... Given the scale, sorry, do you have another question in this area? Wait, just one question before you yeah, wrap okay. up. Sorry, uh, convener. It's just it's, it's to do with the, the, the point that Linda was raising about personal allowance um, and no detriment. Um, and, and, and am I right in my understanding that if let's assume that the Smith Commission proposals come into effect and uh, income tax is devolved, um, personal allowance remains at the UK level. Um, if the UK government goes into election and says we're going to raise the personal allowance. Um, because we want to reduce the amount of income tax that people pay, uh, and they get elected on that basis and they raise the, the, the personal allowance. That's a political decision. They've decided to, to reduce the amount of income tax they get. They may get tax from other taxes from somewhere else. Um, uh, pretty much, obviously, taxes which are not devolved. Um, but obviously, does that then uh, effectively reduce the amount of uh, tax taken Scotland to the Scottish Government? And does that then, f does it automatically follow that is a the, a no detriment, so the no detriment clause comes into effect, would the UK government then effectively have to pay the balance and otherwise raise the, the block grant element, or would the Scottish government have to find some other ways and raise an income tax somewhere else? Yeah, we, according, no. to, according to what's said in page 31, that would be a decrease in rest of UK income tax, that's, and, and I would expect, therefore, there to be a you know, an adjustment to compensate because you know, that's what no detriment would imply. You know, you, what you cannot have is a situation where the rest of the UK decides to change its taxation and it erodes the, the Scottish income tax base. I think that would go against the no detriment clause. So how this gets implemented is absolutely critical. It, just wait, is it clear that that is exactly what will happen? It, uh, no, not, not, no, it's not well, at the moment it's that, not, they haven't been laid out in legislation. No, no, that's, uh, that's no. not thought. How do you make it clear? <laughs> If, if, there's, if there's an answer to that. Well, I, I think you're, you're planning, convener, to move on to the next question, yeah, which is probably part yeah. of the answer to that. Yeah, We've okay. identified an issue that we can't resolve around this table. Okay, well, let, 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 let me let Stuart McMillan come in and sort of sweep this area up about no detriment, and then we'll come into a discussion about the block grant adjustment and fiscal framework and how you think that might best be <coughs> together. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, earlier on, uh, uh, Mr Barber, you mentioned also the issue of the differential uh, in terms of, the, uh, in terms of uh, business. And uh, it, kind of, it struck me uh, when, you were, when you gave that uh, kind of explanation earlier on that um, in terms of elsewhere in the world where there are devolved uh, parliaments and assemblies, um, where maybe 
the powers that they have uh, may or may not be uh, similar to this, but uh, to what we have here, but uh, and also with the proposals that we have. Uh, but uh, elsewhere, uh, is there any evidence of, as a, co as a consequence of maybe some some additional powers or some powers that they have, is there any evidence uh, of uh, businesses actually moving from one part uh, of uh, of a nation state, maybe from one uh, kind of one region, whatever, to and maybe to another part of that same nation state because of the because of the taxation uh, situation is maybe slightly improved. I, I mean, it could be improved. It could be. I mean, obviously, it's going to be better somewhere in one place or another if there's differentials. And how much of a driver that is, I'm not sure. Stephen, you've worked across here. I, 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 I can give you a, a straight example. I think so that um, when. Um, uh, we see people um, moving to Switzerland. We will see a uh, choice as to where people live while they're on international secondment based on the um, approaches of the different cantons. Um, and choices will be made um, in other places as well. New York has a city tax, so you might choose to live outside of New York. So there are examples where people will look at what the impact will be on quite a close geography. Mm. Okay, quite a close geography. Is that answer? Right. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. okay no, that, that's helpful. Um, uh, certainly, also in the PwC um, uh, paper that we have uh, under the, uh, the income tax um, section, it's one, two, paragraph four, uh, but it uh, starts off with the timing of the introduction of the new rules. Um, and also, because on, you're going to talk about the, the plans to implement the changes already in the Scotland Act 2012. It's on page one. So, timing of the introduction, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, that, that particular uh, sentence, um, how, how do you feel, uh, or what do you believe, in terms of the, what Smith is proposing? Uh, how that will actually affect, obviously, what has passed uh, beforehand and also with uh, the situation with uh, them, uh, those issues being fully uh, rolled out in Scotland and also with uh, Smith. Because you, you do discuss the, the issue of, the, uh, of, uh, sort of your clients uh, preparing for also these rules uh, from 2012. Um, f um, our clients are actually preparing for Scotland Act 2012 mm -hmm. and the changes coming in in... Um, obviously with the rates, possible changes in 2016. Um, I think they're using their own experience from real-time information and from preparation for auto-enrolment to basically communicate with their workforce, to get their payroll and their systems right, and to look at their policies to make sure they're consistent with the changes that are going to be happening and how they manage that. And I think it is quite clear that employers and employees need a timing to almost make those changes and work them through, but to communicate them effectively. And if you look at that in respect of the changes post the Smith Commission, it's almost for them as a business, it's the uncertainty around when those changes will happen and how they will then implement those changes and plan for those. So business generally needs a lead-in time to get their systems correct, to communicate across the workforce and to work out if initially, if even if not longer term, what the additional administration burden is around those changes and how they will actually plan for that. So, but certainly, I mean, we've already heard uh, this morning that in terms of what's proposed, um, it's not a it's not a, a huge change. Although some of the, the, the some of the likes of income tax, and it's interwoven, as we've already heard, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not a huge change. Um, so you use words there like uh, like administrative burden and uncertainty. But mm -hmm. because it's not a huge change, then it really uh, it shouldn't be as much of a uh, of a of an amendment or, or of a uh, or, or of an additional burden to use your terminology um, as a consequence of Smith. I'd say what I would say around that is I think it's very important as we've seen when you look at the experience around RT, uh, real time information and auto enrolment, you tend to find that in effect there have been different deadlines for different types of size of employers and complexity and almost that's been a way to embed the change in 
and to actually learn what the practical issues are. So if you think about it with Scotland Act 2012 and the embedding of that change, that's almost a forerunner for your changes for the post-devolution and Smith Commission changes to learn what those things are because there are generally tweaks along the way to make it actually practical for business and for their employees. And that's been tried and tested through those two changes. Can I ask you supplementary to that? Are you, yeah. are you, are you in effect, arguing that the 2012 Scotland Act changes shouldn't be implemented in 2016, but to wait until we see what Smith's like? Or a, a, just so I can be absolutely clear, yeah. because no, that's I, the logical end of no, your argument. Sorry, I'm, I, I obviously misled you. No, what I'm saying is, you know, to actually let this 2012 Act changes come through and learn the change the practical issues from those changes to actually have enough lead-in time to <coughs> build those in to the Smith Commission changes is probably the right thing to do and probably what business would cope with. But in effect, you need to be clear about your timing and when they will know what those changes are going to be. So, so it's, it's a communication it's so, so it's exercise learning from as well. 2012 before we implement Smith is what you're saying? Exactly, yes. Okay. Can I just mention, uh, certainly ICAS would completely support that. I think some of these processes, you're absolutely right, they're not difficult. It's, it's just an extension of what we've got. And in theoretical terms, it's perfectly straightforward and simple. You just tweak the computer and, and stick through a different rate. But, uh, well, uh, do, do you know what I mean? Uh, but having said that, it's, it, in pure processing terms and getting your IT up to scratch, Payroll tends to be collected by employers, by pension providers. They all need to get their systems in place, and there is a long lead time on that. Uh, HMRC, who will be administering it for, for us, they'll have a long lead time too, and they've got quite a lot on their plate between staff cuts, bringing in digitisation, trying to transform a lot of their processes. And so you don't want another, oh, just change this on top of it. And I think it would be really important... Uh, to try and bring 2012 in in 2016 and get that properly bedded in and then maybe two years later for argument's sake you can then extend your rates and bans. Okay, that's quite an important point you just made there Charlotte because it took four years sorry yeah four years from 2012 to 2016 mm -hmm. but, you, but you're arguing you, you think it could be done in two years now instead of the four-year time scale it was there previously that's quite I, helpful. I, th I think quite a lot of the work towards having Scottish pay codes has been put in place and this will just expand it slightly. I mean, I do think it's largely system changes. The other thing that I think is really important too is that the public are aware of what's coming in because I'm not sure that everybody knows they're going to have Scottish income tax as of 2016, uh, let alone anything different. I think they'll only really get to know if it changes. That'll be the, 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 <laughs> then, then they'll know about it. Yeah, okay, just make sure that the, the rest of the panel agree that two-year sort of period Sorry. We'd be long enough. Sorry, my, my, my facial reaction on that was yeah, we're right. in 15 and we're looking at 18. Yeah. So I'm not sure how the months sit, but we may have longer than two years to look at that. Okay. Um, I know the legislation hasn't come through, but in terms of preparing the, pu the public for that, as part of what's coming through on preparing the public for 2012, we know that more is coming down the track. Yeah, so, so 2016 we passed the legislation spring, and in 2018 we start setting rates at that stage. The, the second change will not have as much okay. impact in terms of change as the first change will have. Okay, well, that that's helps give us some clarity of what industry uh, and business would think. Is it okay if I move into the block grant adjustment area? Mark, I think you indicated, if I've got that right, that you would Yeah, that um, obviously we've, we've seen a sort of microcosm uh, of, of what might be to come with the recent tax powers that have been applied, particularly land and buildings transaction tax, which was to replace stamp duty. Um, we saw that the Scottish Government consulted early um, with a view to uh, announcing its its proposed rate, uh, rates and bandings um, in the draft budget. We then saw an autumn statement which um, made changes to stamp duty, which uh, led to a, a block the further complications around the block grant adjustment which took some time to resolve and we saw the Scottish Government announcing a, a revised rate um, there have been some concerns expressed to the committee by for example Professor David Heald that 
the um, requirement of the Scottish Government to uh, declare its hand early, if you will, in relation to taxation um, might open up the possibility of Treasury gaming uh, around tax. And I wondered what your views on that would be and whether you see that as a potential risk um, to the Scottish Government and, and, and to, to the tax system. I mean, I, I'm happy to start. I mean, I, I think this is I think this is one of those areas that will be uh, absolutely could be subject to gaming, and I think this is why there have to be very clear understandings of how these issues are, are resolved uh, between uh, between ministers and, and on, on both sides. I suppose, uh, as an economist, I would quite I mean, there's quite a lot of emphasis when, it, when there's a talk about the fiscal framework and trying to create some independent assessment of the whole fiscal framework, as we know, through the OBR and the UK level with the Scottish Fiscal Commission here. And I wonder whether one way out of this to avoid conflict, because, you know, more often than not, what you'll have is, is, is governments perhaps taking different interpretations, might be to try and find some role for these independent uh, experts to be able to give some sort of judgment which will inform those interministerial discussions because I, I do think there might be situations there where um, there will be, you know, there, there might be conflict because it's really, I mean, at least with that, those particular tax, taxes, as was said earlier, they were completely devolved and at least there it's about first and second round effects from that. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with income tax and with, 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 with other uh, forms of expenditure, including elements of expenditure that are not within within Dell, which, so it's a very different process. I think the danger is there will be very different interpretations as to what's going on, and and I think that could lead to, to some difficult discussions. Uh, and I mean, well, obviously, the, the the point has been made that um, the you know if if for example the UK government took a decision to radically increase the personal allowance that would impact on the Scottish tax take without the Scottish Government having any influence on paper uh, on that decision to be taken. And while the UK uh, Exchequer would have obviously a full range of tax levers at its disposal so it could essentially offset the decision it had taken through other tax increases, that flexibility would not exist at a Scottish level to the same degree. And that then brings in, I think, the question around no detriment uh, alongside that. So one of the points that's been made at the Finance Committee by the Law Society of Scotland is that there should be some form of essentially financial fair play agreement which would prevent such scenarios arising. Is that something you could conceive of and is it something you would say would be a good thing to introduce? I, I personally, I mean, it sounds sensible, and it's. But again, it would be what what evidence would be brought to bear to that sort of uh, financial fair play? Because again, it could be an issue of interpretation. Which is again, I wonder whether there might be a role, you know, for the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission in those circumstances to be able to say, well, we think this is a, a fair play sort of. Uh, this, this is sort of evidence based on which that fair play might be might be might be discussed because otherwise I think it, it's inevitable you might get some gaming happening. I don't know if any of our other witnesses have anything to add to Professor Muscatelli's comments. I, 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 I can't um, discount the um, the comments that Professor Hill meant. I, I think that it needs to go further. Um, I think it's in line with the Smith recommendations um, in relation to improved <laughs> intergovernmental working etc. Okay. Some of the general points. I mean, you know, I think the fair play and some of the, you know, the, the recognition that there needs to be some sort of discussion, and we accept it's all difficult. But again, coming back to any given constitutional situation, independence, full fiscal autonomy, or whatever, surely difficult discussions and relationships are better than no discussions. Because the impacts would, again, still be the same, would they not? A smaller country, dominant economic partner, making decisions on taxation, whatever, in any of these areas would have an impact. But the difference is, in, if there were two countries side by side, one big, one small, they would have a full range of one would have a full range of fiscal levers. Here, it's a it's a not it's not an equal you know, not an equal no. situation. So you, you need, I think, a framework to have those discussions. At the moment, uh, you know, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is able to, to make their autumn statement 
have a budget um, uh, which, without too much reference to what's happening in Scotland, I suppose what I'm saying is you need to have some sort of structure which, in, yeah. which has consultation before that. If there are differences of opinion, some way of resolving those differences of opinion. So it, it does bring into play a very different relationship between the two governments. So do, it should. Do, 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 do you agree then that difficult discussions are better than no discussions as you've just described? Absolutely. Well, I think difficult discussions and a framework for trying to resolve those if there is no agreement. Well, that's helpful. Sh Charlotte was going to come in, I think, as well. No, no, no that's fine. fine. Good. That, that's helpful in laying out a potential framework for, the, for these discussions to take place in. But, of course, as parliamentarians, whether you're at the House of Commons, the House of Lords, or here in the Scottish Parliament, knowing what's going on in these discussions, and if there are tensions existing, now, no government's going to give away a pre-negotiating place, but... Would you agree that if these discussions are going to take place in a, in a sort of structure that Professor Anton Muscatelli described, that needs need to be as transparent as they can be, otherwise the gaming element will be even stronger? Um, I just wonder, and, and have you any idea how we, make that, how we can make these more transparent? Part of your transparency is a, a really clear understanding of how the technicalities and administrative sides of tax interact. Because over the course of my professional career, I think one of the things that's quite difficult is that, well, coming back to that corporation tax example, perhaps people don't always completely appreciate the behavioural consequences that come out of one tax changing and affecting another. And, you know, we gave the example earlier on of if income tax rates were to move, one might look at running one's business through a company, as a for instance. And it's a, it's a clear understanding of how pulling different levers might make people go and do something different. OK, that's, uh, that's effectively saying, yes, transparency is vital in this process. Yes. Right, and who wants to have a go at telling me how the block grant works then? <laughs> you know? You know and, and it, because until such time as we've got real transparency around that mechanism and how it changes... Perhaps I can come back in on that, because yeah. uh, that, that is a very relevant point, and particularly in relation to the VAT, which ought to bring you in quite a bit of money, because I don't think it's obvious how that's going to be calculated uh, just as a kind of standard number now, never mind taking it on and looking at its effects through the economy or through the, the block grant adjustment. I, I'm not going to put my head above the parapet with block grant adjustments. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anybody in the country <laughs> could put their head above the parapet. <laughs> could I just add one thing, which I think is important? Why might the UK be different from other countries? I think one of the issues is that the UK has had such a centralised system of tax and revenue setting that there is a different psychology in the, in, in the Treasury about these things. And I think this is an issue which needs to be overcome because we're now trying to put in place a structure which is much more akin to a federal country. Yeah. Now, uh, now how, it's how you do that and you overcome and you create more symmetry in, in the power structure within, within you know, the, the instruments of government, let alone the, the political scrutiny of that. And I think it, it will require quite a psychological change, if you, uh, if you like, in Treasury in terms of how it considers preparing for a budget, consulting on this. And I think this is, this is one of the big issues, that it's a big change of culture, if you like. Well, so one last supplementary for me in this, and I'll go to Alec. And I think, Stuart, I, want, Linda, I know Linda wants to t touch on VAT. Yeah, yeah, okay, well, I'll come. I'll come. Okay, well, Alex, and then Linda, then Stuart. But first of all, this structure, to be made transparent, to make it work, to give business certainty, to know what's going on, how soon do we need to see these structures beginning to emerge um, to make sure this all works? I'll ask <laughs> Vice <laughs> Waterhouse Coopers <laughs> to, to begin an answer on that one if they can. Uh, I'm not going to give you a calendar date, I'm afraid, but I yeah. think that um, the initial steps around um, informing business of what's going on, that, that, that ball's rolling. I think there's a piece around individual members of the public in relation to um, some of the tax changes that are proposed, most obviously in um, relation to place of residence that haven't started yet and people don't know what's coming. 
um, talking to friends, people in the street, there's still no great sense of um, the potential for income tax changes. Um, I would say there's a lot to do in terms of the process and specifically the points that you're referring to. Um, it needs more of a sense of purpose of where we're going to get to when, a project plan, if you like, rather than a what's expedient for a particular day. Okay. And else want to try and pick up on that? I just want to leave it. We need a project <coughs> plan. Okay, fair enough. Alex? I'm just sorry, I'm yeah, yeah, project yeah, plan. Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, I think we got a clue yesterday. Uh, in uh, John Swinney's speech when he told us that the fis fiscal adjustment regarding the uh, land and property uh, tax in Scotland uh, was dealt with by, after a two-year standoff, they agreed to split the difference between the, the two estimates. Uh, I take it you would agree that that's not a basis for progress in this area. <laughs> You might not feel comfortable putting that out on a transparent <laughs> basis, I don't know. But, the, yep. how, how do you see the, the strengths within the partners who will be negotiating this? Now, the, the, I want, uh, what I'm talking about here is the, the strength of the framework that's required. But do you see it as a situation where uh, any Scottish government having to negotiate with the Treasury is going to start off at a position of disadvantage and therefore requires an extremely strong framework within which to operate? Um, I'm only going to comment in very general terms on that, um, but I would look at where similar arrangements have worked in the past internationally. Have you any examples? Uh, Czechoslovakia. Pardon? Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. They're two different states, though. They weren't, but they now are. Okay, so it's what they did before. But, but uh, I think they might be learning that. What about Canada? I'm not in a position to comment on Canada. I've not worked in Canada. Okay. I think, uh, I, I think we should learn from other states. I think Canada might be useful to look at, although, of course, it's a bit different because they do their horizontal equalization a bit differently from uh, having a block grant, which is based on a historic formula. Um, I, I would look... I think there is issue about asymmetry of power here, potentially, because of the resources available to, to both sides. And also, I think the culture is something that you can't... You know, you can't change centuries of history of... of Treasury being at the centre of, of, of UK uh, um, fiscal decisions. And therefore, I would like to see if there was some way of, of creating some arbitration, or, or but this is why I brought into play the possibility of OBR and Scottish Fiscal Commission possibly working together to try and adjudicate whether there are very different perspectives. Now, now, how do you embed that into legislation is another matter because, because it's, it becomes an administrative convention perhaps between the two governments, but you, you know, it could lead, at least they might resolve the issue of things trundling on for, for several years after every budget bill on how do we adjust the block grant. <laughs> okay, I've got half a bit of soup here, I think. <laughs> so therefore, the quicker we, the two governments can talk to each other and come to an agreement of what the framework looks like and what, what the different institutions involved in it to make sure it's got that strength is important. But listen, um, Linda, I think you've got a supplementary and a VAT issue yes. today, so and they'll go to you first, and I'll go to then what, to with the supplementary or both. Do the supplementary and then get into VAT. And get into VAT, yeah. right? Okay. It was just um, something a supplementary struck me when Professor Muscatelli used the F word, the federalism, um, and it's, all the sort of constitutional academics and, and others that we've listened to when they discuss federalism they describe it as power sharing. And I, I just would like a, an opinion um, as to whether what's an offer in the draft clauses is in fact power sharing. Right. I mean, I'll go, I'll go on that. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, federalism is a very difficult word to, to decode because th there are different fiscal arrangements in different federal countries. However, uh, coming back to the discussion we've just had, I think given the interdependence that the fiscal structure that's proposed from Smith is, is, is suggesting, I think if there isn't some form of power sharing around these decisions, I think it will create real difficulties. It really will. Uh, because, uh, And it's part of the fact that we have never had to have that in the UK because you know, fiscal powers have been so centralised. But I, I think if we don't, if we don't have find some element of power sharing, for, uh, then I think 
it, it doesn't amount to federalism. Federalism, by definition, as you say, is, is about distributing power. And mm -hmm. uh, this is about trying to adapt what is a very centralized structure to do something a bit different. And I think it'll, it'll be difficult, it'll take time, but it'll also be very difficult unless there's the willingness on the part of Treasury to share some of that power. I was just going to say the emphasis has to be on sharing because the taxes that are fully devolved are quite small taxes that, I mean, you're not going to run a country on, on the strength of those finances. Mm. And, and some of them aren't even designed as, as money raisers. You know, landfill tax is an environmental one, isn't it, rather than money raising per se. So, and the income tax has joint responsibilities in it, so it has to be a sharing one. And therefore, one way or another, folk will have to pull together in making it work. Charlotte, it was um, something you said right at the start in the opening statements about VAT oh, right, right. struck me. And what you said was that uh, the VAT calculation uh -huh. um, that's going to come being an assignment of tax wouldn't give any reflection of the Scottish economy. Well, and I just would, would like you to... Explore that a little bit further. OK. Where am I coming from? Yeah. It depends on how you measure VAT, uh -huh. but the, conceptually, the way VAT works, it, it, there's a bit of tax added at every stage in the process. Uh -huh. And if you make the assumption that your economy, you, you get raw materials, you make widgets, and then you add something of value to them, and then they go to a distribution centre, and then they go to mm -hmm. shops. So there's various stages in the process. And at each stage, you're adding value. And the idea behind a VAT, a value-added tax, is that you're measuring, you're taxing just that bit of value that's added in each stage in the process. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, just like we've been talking about having a centralised treasury, we've quite a centralised or integrated economy. And so uh, there's no guarantee that everything that's done in Scotland is going to stay in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And it, there was an interesting discussion, for instance, in the Finance Committee about making biscuits in Glasgow and then... Do you know, they were made here, they went to a distribution centre in England, and then they were distributed all around the place. So there's two questions. Firstly, where do you measure the VAT? Mm -hmm. uh, do you know, is it when you make something here? Is it when you sell it there? Uh, so how do you measure output tax and input tax to get the Scottish bit? It can be done because we measure how much VAT is in the UK... Mm -hmm. uh, so don't get me wrong, you can easily do it, but we don't do it just now. And there's kind of borders around it in order to measure the UK element mm -hmm. going into Europe or out of Europe. Uh, and you would need to do something like that in an administrative sense. And I don't know if traders would be really keen on doing a lot more administration mm -hmm. around that. Uh, and I don't know how you measure whether your outputs are here or there. Uh, you can certainly do a broad estimation, 8% of the economy, mm -hmm. uh, and that would be absolutely fine, and we'd welcome that from an administrative point of view. But if you just take 8% of the economy, then it doesn't really completely reflect policies, economic policies that are being undertaken here to boost... Do, do you know there's mm -hmm. not such a direct mm -hmm. marry-up? And the more accurate your measure, the more intricate it is to calculate it. So, back to the principle of no detriment or the principle of whether you gain or whether you lose. Yes. To put it in simple terms. Absolutely. You could you could end up in the situation that you have a Scottish government that's doing loads to boost the economy. Uh-huh. And unless the intergovernmental relations and power sharing are adequate, they could get no benefit from or, or it might be difficult to measure the benefit. And right. it's not just intergovernmental re relations because it's traders who collect all your VAT. So uh, they're the ones that would be doing a lot of the administra administration. Right. HMRC will obviously be doing some of it as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So you've got all those kind of features to factor in. And yes, I, I think, it, of course, you can measure the economy and how much goes mm -hmm. into the VAT. It's just the intricacy of, of how you get there, and if you're going to factor in no detriment as well, well, it just adds to the calculations, mm. I think. And I don't know if we've got the machinery at the moment to do those. Right, thank you. 
Okay, still in VAT, I think Stuart Maxwell and then yeah. Alex has got it's, a question. It's, it's, it's in exactly the same area because I picked up exa <laughs> exactly the same uh, point. And I'm just, uh, again, you know, excuse me if it's me, but I'm struggling to understand how um, there will be an agreement to measure the impact of Scottish Government actions, either positively or negatively on the economy in relation to VAT, uh, the tax take from VAT, um, because it's clearly not a direct necessarily a direct yeah. impact or connection between the two things. You know, for example, if, if the Scottish Government invests heavily in education or research mm -hmm. or something, you know, there's an impact on business, which then has an impact on VAT, etc. You know, there's lots of different com complications there. And, and, and can anybody on the panel see either a straightforward or, in fact, any way that this could be accurately calculated, either positively for the Scottish mm -hmm. uh, Government or negatively for the Scottish Government? How, how could it be done? I certainly think you can do it accurately. I mean, you can do what you want. It, it, mm -hmm. It's it's the burden that goes it's with burden, it. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's, but, it's, it's, but the point I made about the direct, the causal effect between one action. I think and that's the, very difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it'll be difficult to measure, which is one of the reasons why, when you see around the world assignation being used, it's more really as a way of. Of, uh, of it's it's not as a way of trying to hand over tax powers, which can then influence the tax base. It's more as a well, here's your share of the tax take, and 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 you can use this uh, on spending decisions. I think the I think you might be able to do it. Uh, I, I think to impose administrative uh, requirements, which requires value added to be tracked at every single yeah, stage, would yeah. be hugely burdensome. Yeah. I think that the, the only way one, one could try to capture what you've just asked, which is, you know, how could you in the medium term take, a, take into account the fact that the Scottish Government say it might have been successful in growing its, its economy, is to try and look at, you know, value added in different, uh, different, in different parts of the UK and then in some way linking the take to, to that and, and therefore recalculating the, the share at the moment, the, the, temp, the first 10 percentage point or, and the two and a half or from the 5 percent reduced rate saying, well, okay, GVA in, in Scotland has grown by 10 percent. It's grown in the rest of the UK by 8 percent over this period of time. Let's try and adjust yeah. over time to take account of that. And I think that's the only way in which it could be done in an approximate way, I think. And just uh, one, one other, further question, and it's, it's to do with the, the PwC paper and the conclusions page. And it's on the point that uh, Professor Muscatelli just raised about the purpose of assigning taxes. It's about, no, that's your share, effectively. I mean, one of your bullet points says, assigning, if I can just quote from it, assigning tax revenues as an alternative to devolution may seem an attractive compromise. Our concern is that this would increase both administrative complexity and exposure to tax volatility without any commensurate increase in the direct control of the Scottish Parliament over revenue raising. Accountability would not be enhanced. Is, is that the reason that, yeah. that you said that effectively? Because it's, it's effectively that's your share as opposed to an actual devolved control of this tax. Exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Alex. Yeah. Just very briefly, uh, I think Professor Muscatelli actually came up with what I was going to ask there. Uh, but just to clarify, uh, if we were to take the simplistic approach that was suggested uh, a moment ago, that we just have a percentage. Uh, of the UK economy and allocate VAT uh, uh, according to that. Uh, Professor Muscatelli suggested that that could be potentially, I think that's what you said, is vary it uh, according to economic indicators uh, that we, in many cases, already have for Scotland. Uh, always looking for the simplest approach. Uh, is uh, a set percentage which is then varied according to relative economic performance an approach that would work? I don't see why it shouldn't. I think it could work. I think one of the interesting issues it then raises longer term is is what is the purpose of the block grant? Uh, as I said, in, 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 in the UK, it is essentially it's a historic allocation. If you if you look at other countries that make a lot of use of tax assignation, Germany mm -hmm. being one example, it then has a different mechanism for horizontal equalisation. So it may raise that issue that if you have divergence in the UK, unless supposing the Scottish economy grows faster than other parts of of, of the UK. Then it may raise over time the issue. Well, you know, how, how does this, how should this be taken into account in terms of, of, of burden sharing around horizontal equalisation? But, but I, I do think, uh, you know, you, you know, uh, the administrative complexities of trying to do it any other way, but that way, uh, but trying to estimate value added in different parts of the UK would be quite considerable. But. I'm going to try and just dig. I'm sorry. I want to just. This is quite intriguing, actually. I want to just dig a wee bit deeper on this. Do we know if there are any figures available that show 
the various, and they probably don't exist, that what the various VAT take is from the, the, the either the regions or the nations of the United Kingdom. Does that exist anywhere? Well, it is estimated within jurors, for instance, in terms of, uh, but, uh, and I don't know enough of the detail of how those, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's constructed. Uh, I, I, it is estimated at the moment in part, as, as part of jurors, but also as part, uh, I, I, so I it is guess, possible. I would guess then, if we're going to start with a, a percentage element to begin with and then an adjustment afterwards, that'd be pretty crucial for Scotland to know uh, in terms of the decision about where that percentage level lay, lay at, because we could st either start off with an incredibly advantageous position or a very difficult position. So that first calculation will be vital in ensuring that the interests of the, the amount of money coming to Scotland is maintained, I would have thought. So uh, if there are any help, help after today that you can consider that you might, because as far as I'm concerned, the game is here to make sure that Scotland gets the best out of this deal. And therefore, if there's any particular method, methodology that you think might be helpful after today that you could let us know about, that would be very helpful. Because I know it's quite very detailed. Bill? Thank you very much, convener. Right, um, this, might, <laughs> this might sound a wee bit outro, I don't know, or it might be something that's actually already in place. Is there a potential, uh, may I ask, for some independent body tax um, czar type of thing um, to establish what has been uh, the benefit to an increase in Scotland's uh, potentially say Scotland was outperforming the rest of the UK economically, uh, but uh, something was being done at Westminster which actually uh, caused detriment to Scotland in terms of economic, uh, in terms of taxation raised. But you don't want to have an argument between two parliaments, one saying, well, this is the way we're doing it and you're just going to have to put up with it. Would there be a potential for someone then to actually arbitrate over that? Or is that something which is, would have to be completely new? Or I can't immediately think of any parallel that I can give you that is on all fours with what you're saying. I think this is something that should be, uh, it's a possible outcome of intergovernmental discussion, right. along with other potential outcomes. I think, I think Anton already described a structure that whether it was the Fiscal Commission and OBR in some way working together that might give us that arbitrary but it's not but it's not what you're it's not what you're asking for as a sort of court of final appeal. Yeah. Appeal but something that would be ongoing on a you know um, throughout the, the fiscal year. Um, because it would be unreasonable to wait until okay. something went wrong before you actually started to, to address the issue. Okay. So it was basically just to ask if it, if it seemed reasonable to anyone um, that, uh, that there would be an ongoing calculation and someone would be able to say, well, this has been to detriment and therefore that needs to be equalised or, or, uh, or set, set correctly. And I don't know if that's possible. I think that's a reasonable approach. I mean, I'd suggest that as a convener said something which builds on the fact that already Scotland and the, and the UK have the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a very different context, not around taxation, but around spending, of course, Australia has the Commonwealth Grants Commission, which is there to try and pr make a recommendation to Parliament around allocation of grants mm -hmm. uh, across across the federal, federal state to try and depoliticise it in some way. Mm -hmm. And one could think of something similar where there, if the two governments can't agree, maybe there's some way of bringing together the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission to say, well, in the absence of agreement, we suggest that this is an interpretation of, of what is actually happening here. But that's just a suggestion and maybe better mechanisms around. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's a very, very helpful suggestion, actually. We're going to do a bit more examination of that. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Eric and Vera. Um, Section 17 uh, of the, the Smith Commission um, it, it talks about the issue of the, the changing needs and aspirations uh, of the people of Scotland uh, within the UK and, and uh, as a result uh, it may be appropriate to devolve further powers beyond those set out in the heads of agreement where doing so would aid the implementation of the consensus reached by the parties in this report. Uh, and following on from the discussion that we've had uh, earlier on this morning, 
Um, so, uh, Ms. Barber you mean, uh, and uh, Professor Muscatelli, I mean, I think, uh, both of you used the words uh, like sort of centralisation in terms of the, t of the Treasury uh, and also the, the taxes, uh, well, the, well, the powers that are to come. Um, they're not really kind of, uh, income uh, generating uh, powers. I also mean the, the VAT, that's an assignation. Um, so, <coughs> bearing in mind that Section 17, are there any, uh, are there any uh, taxation powers that you think? or any other powers that you think that actually should come to Scotland to actually to deal with uh, Section 17 of Smith? Do you want me to go first? I, when we put in our original submission to Smith, I think we were focusing on income tax because it kind of flowed from the, the changes that are already afoot. And one of the things that we had commented on in that submission was that we didn't think the general population were particularly aware that they already were getting the Scottish rate of income tax and Smith expands upon this or you know, takes it further down. I think there would be a lot to be said for seeing how all of that works before one looked at further taxpayers. Uh, I would have thought you'd have quite a lot of responsibilities with income tax. And we've got the individual taxes, and it's been interesting to see how the land and buildings transaction tax is starting to have an impact, even though we haven't got it yet. Uh, and all of those, I think perhaps we ought to work with them before looking at other taxes to devolve. Uh, they might be for later and they might be something too that you would look at more across the UK about how you, you devolve powers to Wales, for instance, for Northern Ireland. Uh, I know this sounds really perverse, but you want some kind of overall control about how you devolve your powers, don't you? In terms of maybe corporation tax going one way, income tax going another way. It, it, it seems a bit disjointed. What, what the present system? Or, the the, or the way uh, corporation tax is being devolved, say, mm -hmm. to Northern mm -hmm. Ireland. Uh, some income tax here, uh, uh, Wales are, are getting some powers too following. And, and as I say, it, it does seem perverse to say you want some kind of oversight of how you hand out powers. But maybe if, if all region, regions, nations... God, I'm about to put my foot in it, haven't I? Uh, if, <laughs> if everybody got income tax powers, for instance, then it would make it much easier to negotiate how power is properly decentralised. In a sense, I, I set a lot of this out in the paper that I submitted to this committee back here. I think it was November. I mean, in my view, the, the cleanest solution, given that there does seem to be a strong appetite in Scotland now for greater fiscal autonomy, would have been to have a package which would have involved not only complete income tax devolution, including the personal allowance, but national insurance contributions, and also perhaps in some flexibility around employers' national insurance contribution to try and affect employment, since this is one of the issues that is of particular concern, seems to be of concern to, to, to Scotland. I also suggested that areas like VAT would be subject more to assignation and because of European rules, and, and I suggested that perhaps on corporate taxation there might be some flexibility along, around that in a way perhaps to avoid sort of administrative complexity, linking in more to employment decisions again around, you know, where, 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 in, where companies are deciding where to locate in the UK. And that was something suggested by the, by the Holton Commission in Wales. And I think it's some of these things that I, I think could have been explored to go further than the current, uh, the, the current set of powers that are proposed by Smith. We're back before we've begun. We mentioned earlier this tip and balance, and, and of course... Uh, the devolution of more powers and getting a balance in that to, to the full fiscal autonomy and the impact on the Barnet formula. Would anyone want to comment on that? Because there have been some serious concerns about the full fiscal autonomy and the end of the Barnet formula, which wouldn't be exactly a happy place to be at this point. Well, I mean, I, I mean, if you have come for full fiscal autonomy, well, I'm, I'm arguing. I was arguing for a more rational package, which, which was, I think, to try and avoid some of these sort of splitting taxes yeah. in half. And 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 I was suggesting, I think, to my last submission in November, how that might be achieved if. 
and, and, and I did say at the beginning of that paper, if you recall, there is no correct answer. It's about the political economy of this. It's about the will of, the, of, of what the Scottish people want. If, if, if Scotland would like more fiscal autonomy, then this is the logical way to progress, and these are the taxes that you would start with, and these are the ones you would have last. Uh, and, and, and I suggested that you could even do some things around corporation tax. What you do with the block grant, I think, absolutely does depend on how much fiscal autonomy you have. If you have almost complete fiscal autonomy, then by definition, the only issue around the block grant is would you want a block grant which equalizes horizontally across the UK, across the nations, to try and share some of, you know, provide some insurance mechanism? Barnet is a very uh, is, is a historic construction which was there to try and, um, you know, it's, it's there because of how. How, how the history of, 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 of fiscal allocation has happened in the UK. Clearly, if you had 100% fiscal autonomy, then you wouldn't have the block grant as it's currently cons constituted, but what you would have is perhaps something to equalize in some way to, to burden share or, or share insurance. It would be a different grant, and that's what they have in countries like Germany, that's what they have in Canada, for instance. So it, it depends, yes, absolutely, it depends. It, is, it, it depends on how much fiscal autonomy, uh, how much taxation, the Scottish Parliament would raise as a proportion of its total what, spend. What, what comes first then, federalism or fiscal autonomy? In terms of the German example and the other examples, we've not got, we've not got a, a, a structure that says that we don't pay taxes into the centre or national insurance yeah. into the centre or whatever, but we want you know, some form of safety net through Barnet. I think what I think what we've discussed today I think illustrates that if you give more fiscal autonomy and even in the form envisaged by Smith, you do need to have more decentralised power structures because otherwise it's likely to create more political tension uh, across the UK. I think the two things do go hand in hand. In hand. Um, clearly, you can have federal states across the globe with very different visions of how much equity and how much accountability you have. That's the examples, again, I gave in my paper last time. So Germany is very different from Canada, for instance, because they have a different concept of, of where they want to sit on that spectrum between fiscal autonomy and equity. But certainly, I would say that if you decentralize fiscal powers, as, and this is one model and you could go further, you need to also decentralise administrative and political power because if you don't do that, then you have, could end up in, in conflict situation between the two governments and the two parliaments, and we, want, we wouldn't want to be there. We would want to have some form of, of, of determining uh, solutions to where conflict might arise, and that's, that's you know, back, back to the earlier discussion. We're, we're getting into a very... moving away a bit from what we're supposed to be doing, but I understand why we're doing that. Um, and it's an interesting discussion, but I think we're trying to get back to what our main purpose is, Steve, and then I'm going to come to Alison Johnson. Sorry, I was just, I was just going to comment on the tax question, which, which hopefully will uh, play to your question as well. Um, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are pressures for more um, uniformity of tax rates, for example, cries for um, uniform corporate tax rates across the European Union. So when you're looking at what happens between the rest of the UK and Scotland, you need that context as well. Yeah, fair point. Alison. Um, thank you. I mean, obviously, the Smith Commission w was all about compromise. You know, compromise was required to enable there to be any sort of an agreement, and, and the visions of the parties going into that were, you know, markedly different. Um, but, you know, you have people like Richard Murphy suggesting that, that Scotland's tax solution is, is, is very challenging. It, it's not all that it could be or should be. And they're obviously, you know, you've been speaking this morning about, I think, concerns about putting the devolved tax systems in place um, and running these two sort of domestic related systems side by side. And it seems as well we have a cultural lag. Um, do you think we can address that? Is it possible to get these systems up and running as we need to, when we need to, when we still have a lot of political discussion carrying on? thought there's any reason why you can't make it work. The SDLTs to be switched off, LBTTs coming in, folk are learning as the process goes along, but, you know, hey, it's coming on the 1st of April and we'll have it and it'll work mm -hmm. uh, one way or another. And likewise with the income tax, we've got that coming in in 2016. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. But, but I think if 
you want to do something, you can do it. Uh, you need to be aware of the costs and the administrative burdens and uh, a lot of taxes are not collected by the state realistically. Do, do you know, they fall on employers or the self-employed. Uh, they're self-assessed taxes, so your citizens are going to do it. You need to be aware of the impact. I think that's what we've been trying to talk about this morning in part uh, and how it will be received because not everybody's not everybody's as excited about taxes as, as, as others, and, and that's just a fact of life. Uh, <laughs> do, do you know? So I, I think you need to go canny with some aspects of it, and I think you need to appreciate some of the burdens that business might feel, and bur business won't, don't always look at where their tax comes from, so they've had auto-enrolment, they've had RTI, they've had quite a lot of system changes in recent times, uh, so more it needs to be it recognised what it will do for them. Mm -hmm. And do you think enough attention has been given to making sure they have the, the resources and information that, that they need? Uh, do you think it's... I think with regards to Scotland Act 2012, I think the awareness level is starting to rise. It probably isn't where we would all like it to be. I think some of that plays into the fact that we're not all tax geeks, if you like, but um, I think they're on a journey and it's it's moving in the right direction, which comes back to the point that I think I made earlier. I think to embed Scotland Act 2012 to then take them on the next journey Paul Smith when it comes to income tax is probably the right thing to do because they seem to learn from lessons before and taking it in bite-sized chunks. Because as Charlotte said, they've had a lot of system change. I think Scotland Act 2012 will probably be the embedding of the systems to actually do the th the changes for the further devolved powers, but I do think it's possible. Thank you. Okay, Duncan, I think you've got a question about just, parliamentary just, issues. Just, so. just following on for, for, from that about the culture issue and the change, it, it's going to you know, be necessary to, 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 to open this process up. And already we see, and I have had some criticism about the Smith Commission itself, about politicians behind closed doors. Um, we're into another phase now where we're talking about intergovernmental relations and, and government <coughs> and government officials in closed closed rooms and we you know, I'm starting to get nervous about where the role for parliamentarians are, are in that. Never mind getting uh, you know communities and raising awareness at that level. So you know I don't, I don't know it's about off what you're we're doing this morning, but we whatever happens as you say uh, 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 Charlotte, that, that things are, are changing and different challenges will be there. The role of the Parliament and, 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 and the challenges that the Parliament faces, a Parliament was, it was set up, we haven't really changed the procedures you know, radically um, you know, in the 15 years uh, and the, the responsibilities that we had then. There are going to be greater responsibilities on the Parliament. Um, and I don't know whether you've got any, any comments. Some of the other witnesses in some of the other sessions had some comment about um, the, the importance of um, um, you know, open, say, open uh, and transparent dealings and accountability. And I'm, I'm wondering whether you've, you, you've, you, you share any of these uh, and recognise any of these challenges that we have as a parliament to, to keep pace with this change and ensure that we can... Uh, um, ensure that transparency and open, say, open, uh, open government. Anton, <laughs> I should I should say I should say that I'm not an expert on parliamentary procedure, so you probably <laughs> probably need a constitutional lawyer here. But I, I would certainly agree with you. Absolutely, I think clearly, if you start having intergovernmental discussions around budget bills well in advance of budget bills. The scrutiny that currently is applied by the Finance Committee or by the Treasury Select Committee will need to adapt to that because otherwise you can't have proper parliamentary scrutiny, as you say. At the moment, you know, Treasury Select Committee will scrutinise UK legislation around, around budgets and, and will not pay heed to the fact that there are these interdependencies. Again, it's a change of culture, but you would expect to find some way, perhaps, of the Finance Committee here and the Treasury Select Committee finding some way to to cooperate on that scrutiny, on that parliamentary scrutiny. Okay. Alex? Yeah, um, I wanted to take a step back, maybe from the detail that we've been looking at and comment on one or two of the things that have been said. Now, the power, you know, there is obviously ambition for more power uh, in Scotland, but history is beginning to build up and it shows us something about that ambition for power, and that is that once the power is devolved, 
It doesn't mean to say it's going to be used. We've had the power to vary income tax for 15 years, and it hasn't been varied. We've more recently uh, watched John Swinney go through the process of trying to set the new land and uh, property uh, tax, and the, his primary driver has been to minimise the fiscal variation. He wanted it to be revenue neutral. He's talked about that all the time. So, looking at the powers that have been brought, that are being proposed, how do you feel they will actually deliver for Scotland? Are we going to see an appetite for divergence, or are the, the pressures for convergence going to cause future Scottish governments, with a large basket of powers, to spend their time trying to make things sure things are no different north and south of the border? still have a go at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> do you want me to first go or do you, do you go? <laughs> <laughs> well, rather than commenting on that, can I come at your question from a slightly different angle mm -hmm. and just say that there are a number of points, I think, that, that perhaps need addressed on a wider canvas in terms of public awareness, because Harking back to what I've said already, I'm not sure that people are well conversant with what powers we already have and the fact that they haven't been used or they have been used. And I don't know how you make tax more exciting to non-tax practitioners, but it, it, it's something that perhaps needs to be tried. It becomes exciting to taxpayers when you start increasing it. Well, <laughs> yes, well, maybe, maybe that's a part of, of what needs to, to be looked at, is, is how do you make it of more relevance, it is your accountability mechanism and, and, and needs greater awareness. The other thing that you notice over the years with tax is that, if I use a colloquialism, how, how do you pluck the goose with the least amount of hissing? People don't really like to tell you how much tax you're paying. So that maybe needs to be thought through as to, do you know, what are you telling your electorate and, or your population about your taxes? Politician, I'll, 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 I'll go with the no politician piece. Um, but I think that um, you look at the powers and then you look at how you exercise the power separately. And it's looking at why those powers haven't been exercised or why Sweeney's looking for um, fiscal neutrality currently. Um, and I think there's an element of the public education in relation to taxation. And to give an example of that, um, as an organisation, PricewaterhouseCoopers has been running citizens' juries where we bring um, members of the public into a jury of around 20 people and we inform them on some of the background and the detail of some of the tax changes that might be proposed or some of the discussion around tax. And then we look at the decisions that come through and what people say um, and the broad conclusions from that, um, and we mentioned it in the submission we did to Pre Smith, um, are that people are engaged in that process. We don't pick random off the street, but people become more engaged in the tax process. <laughs> you must come and... No, we don't do that. Um, people are more engaged in the process. People take different decisions based on that increased understanding um, and feel more involved in what's going on. And the sense is that without making everybody tax experts, that the involvement that people have leads to a stronger debate and a better basis on which to, in our case, advise government, but in your case, act on what um, the citizens' juries or other public forums and your other means of understanding pu public representations, um, what, the, what those give you. And the, the strength of that is that you can, um, in government, make decisions that are important to people but feel as though they've been more informed, whether that's on something that I think is more sophisticated than polling in terms of informing decision. Maybe we're making a mistake in asking you to, or you appear to be trying to interpret this politically. I'll try and simplify it <laughs> and, and, and ask, ask you in a slightly different form Please do. that should have a simple answer. Okay. And that nothing we have done so far has provided a system that generates the momentum that overcomes the gravity towards convergence. Mm -hmm. Is Do you see this package 
as achieving the level of momentum that will move, a fr move us from a position of instinctive convergence to one in which divergence is possible? I would say that it's more likely to than what's happened in the past, but I can't go further than that. Hmm. I'm, Sorry. I, I mean, I, I, I would agree with that. I think one argument about why existing powers haven't been used, as I know it certainly has, has got a lot of currency, is the fact that because the powers have been very limited and because of the potential interface, uh, say, take the Scotland Act 2012, essentially it's a flat tax superimposed on the existing UK system, then there's a fear that, you know, it will, it will create the wrong sorts of trade-offs. So by definition, if you give more levers, then it will allow for a more acceptable package or acceptable packages to be put by the political parties to, to, to the electorate. But I do think there is a psychology of taxation issue that Steve mentioned that needs to be overcome. Uh, I mean, it, it's interesting how much debate there is at the moment in the current, uh, in the current sort of political uh, situation around, the, you know, what the priority should be around different public goods, health, education, I wonder whether, you know, we, we've seen, you know, the year of people focusing solely on taxation as a big issue. Uh, you know, we might begin beginning to see some change there where people are willing to say, well, actually, I would like more public goods, thank you very much, and I'm also prepared to pay for it because I recognise what, what, what the economic reality of that is. I, we may be having political debates like that quite, quite soon. I always, I always get, get a smile when the IFS does this study of what has actually happened to taxation post-UK elections when you realise that, in fact, uh, in, on average, I think the estimate is around five billion uh, after every election, tax has gone up more by any promise that was made before. So, yeah. it's, uh, so you know, at the margin, there's clearly attempts to do that, but there is a psychology issue there that, that has to be overcome. And the sort of things that Steve was talking about are very interesting. Linda, supplementary. Uh, just, again, um, something Anton said there. You know, see, like, after every election, tax has gone up, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, income tax is very different. So, so most taxation is indirect taxation. So what level of financial lever is income tax? It's quite, I mean, it is, it is one of the substantial levers. I mean, one of, one of the ways in which, for instance, in the UK taxation uh, has gone up was, for instance, the fact that the 40p tax rate hasn't kept pace with inflation. So, I mean, uh, so that's been, you know, often it's used in that way as opposed to we're going to put up, we're, we're, we're going to put in our manifesto that we're going to put up 2p on, 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 on the whole range of income tax and we're going to pay for this. Often the discourse is a bit more muted, but it... We've seen, for instance, in the UK, income tax burden rising slightly over the last parliament, uh, and that's been largely done through, uh, through the way in which the tax bans and thresholds have been used. Um. OK, I think we've reached the natural conclusion of this discussion, and I'm very grateful to you. One of the jobs I wanted to make sure we achieved today that we could sig signal up where the challenges lie. I think if we can put an achieved tick next to that, because you've managed to do that quite successfully, so we know now where we need to go in terms of further discussion. Uh, and thank you also for coming along and exciting us about tax. It's, it's certainly an, an area that um, is, has become more fascinating as I begin to dig into this. So I'm very grateful to all our witnesses coming along today uh, and contributing the way they have. It's been very helpful. Uh, and I wish you the best for the rest of the day. We're now moving to private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>